Um, uh, Clark, thank you for the kind introduction and for the terrific uh, forum. Um, we're fortunate today to have a panel with uh, real breadth and depth of knowledge of the Iranian uh, nuclear program and U.S. policy with regard to it. Um, on my left is Gary Seymour, who runs the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School and was Obama's coordinator for arms control and WMD terrorism and senior director at the NSC. To his left, Ambassador Joe Detrani is the president of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. He served as station chief for the CIA in Beijing, was the State Department's envoy to six party talks with North Korea, and was the director of the National Counterproliferation Center. To his left, Joe Serencioni, president of the Plowshares Fund and uh, uh, on the Secretary of State's International Security Advisory Board. Um, he has a long career in non-proliferation policy at, um, with CAP and Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, among other places. Ray Take is Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor at Georgetown. He was formerly an advisor at the State Department and has taught at Yale, Berkeley, and the National War College. So, as things stand, there is the very real possibility of war between the United States and Iran in Obama's second term. Um, it's probably useful at the outset to very briefly say how, where things stand and how we got here. Um, I promised uh, the panelists that I would do this in under a minute. It's <laughs> physically impossible to do that, so I will try to do it in under two. Um, you will remember that Obama came into office promising uh, outreach to Iran. Um, that outreach failed, and indeed by the fall of 2009, um, it was revealed that Iran had uh, built and um, was operating a um, underground um, enrichment facility. Um, Israel, very upset by these developments, threatened war. Obama and the administration ratcheted up their rhetoric. Um, these developments uh, concerned then Secretary of State, uh, uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Gates, who felt that the United States was unprepared for war. He prepared a secret three-page memo um, laying out a series of strategic questions that he thought the U.S. needed to answer in preparation for a confrontation with Iran. Uh, some of those questions included, um, were we ready for war? What would happen if Israel went unilaterally to war without us? Um, could we live with a nuclear Iran? Nobody had ready answers to those questions, but um, the memo served as a kind of table of contents for um, uh, a lengthy and uh, intense interagency process led by Tom Donilon uh, that sought to address issues of military preparedness, covert action, intelligence, diplomacy, sanctions, and so forth. Um, uh, let's see where we are now. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, the United States got fairly, uh, got a couple of good breaks. Um, rather than coming to confrontation over the uh, nuclear program with Iran, um, uh, their program was slowed, a combination of covert action uh, and uh, diplomacy and voluntary measures by Iran. Um, however, the program continued. Israel remained concerned. Um, and in the spring of last year, Obama, for the first time, promised to go to war to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Um, uh, this year, uh, the U.S. and a group of countries with which uh, it has been working on a diplomatic solution presented a, a potential uh, diplomatic uh, solution to the problem. Iran has not responded, um, but in the interim there has been an election in which a uh, more moderate uh, 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 president of Iran has been elected. So that's where things stand. Did I do that in under two minutes? I think it was close. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the, the first question I'd like to get to right away is um, whether in the panelist's mind there is in fact a red line that Iran can cross uh, that would lead the United States to launch a military attack against it. Gary, why don't you take sure. a first crack at that? <clears throat> well, the first thing to say is that Iran already has a nuclear weapons capability in the sense that if a political decision was made, Iran could produce nuclear weapons within a year or two. That includes the time required to produce the weapons grade material, to fabricate components for a device, and then, and then to weaponize it into either an air delivered bomb or a missile warhead. 
Uh, in my view, the main reason why Iran hasn't taken that step is because of fear that the supreme leader is worried it will be exposed and it would trigger a conflict with the United States. So from that standpoint, <clears throat> I think President Obama's public warning that he will use military force to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons is helpful. I think it helps to reinforce caution in the minds of Iran's leaders that they might get into a war with the United States if they proceed in certain areas. At the same time, uh, President Obama's warning is very general because he didn't specify exactly what steps we would consider or he would consider to be movement toward the production of a nuclear weapon. And the advantage of being vague is, of course, it gives the president a lot of flexibility, which all presidents want. The danger of being vague is that the Iranians might misinterpret what we would consider to be the essential red lines, and they might blunder across it. And that could lead to a conflict that, frankly, neither side wants. So one issue, I think, for the administration as we get ready for another round of diplomacy with uh, President Rouhani's government is whether we should privately communicate to Iran those actions that we would see as step towards the production of nuclear weapons. And I say private because I think private threats are probably more effective. And that could include things like uh, production of enriched uranium above 20%, which is the current level, that the highest level the Iranians are producing. It could also include um, a resumption of the weaponization program, which our intelligence community thinks was basically halted in 2003. It could include uh, efforts by Iran to build another secret enrichment plant, as they've tried twice already with Natanz and Gom. It seems to me the value of that kind of private warning is that it could buy time for diplomacy. It could, it could lead the Iranians to be more cautious about what they do and therefore create more space for us to try to come up with a diplomatic solution. At the same time, I think the administration, if they're going to make those kinds of private warnings, they have to be very serious, both about our ability to detect those actions and that we'd be prepared to do something serious if we, uh, if we discovered that the Iranians were doing them. Ray, can I ask you, do you think that there's confusion on the Iranian part about what the U.S. red lines are? And then as a follow to that, do you think there's confusion on their part about what the Israeli red lines might be? Well, the Prime Minister Netanyahu has sort of offered his red line in his United Nations speech. This was uh, last year at the UN. He said that if Iran uh, got enough highly enriched or low, medium enriched uranium to, uh, that could then be further enriched to make one bomb, that that would be sufficient for him uh, to launch military action against Iran. That's right. Uh, in terms of how they perceive the American red lines, I think there's always been a perception, and that perception may not be viable or it may not be credible, that the United States is reluctant to engage in military affairs right. against Iran, right. if not the larger, greater Middle East. So in that sense, the threat of military retribution has always had an element of uh, lack of credibility. Then I don't know how you enhance this credibility, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, putting another ship in the Gulf is not, you know, what does that yeah. mean? Uh, that's just a perception about American policy in the Middle East that actually stretches to prior to the Obama administration to the Bush administration. Once, it, once the surge policy began to work, there was a perception that the United States did not want to disturb the stability in Iraq by engaging in Iran. So that for a long time, mm -hmm. across two administrations, the military option has been devalued. That might be a mistake, as Gary said. I mean, so international relations are the history of misjudgments and miscalculations, right? Yeah. So they may actually press their luck as, as they often do. Uh, and the other aspect that we have to talk about is that the American red line has proven, uh, Iranians have transgressed various American red lines uh -huh. with impunity. Impunity in terms of triggering military response, not in terms of triggering a more resolute sanctions regime. If you go back, the United States has had many red lines, as had Israel. And as Iranian nuclear program has matured and has kind of across various thresholds, uh, those particular red lines have been, as I mentioned, tra traversed. Gotcha. Uh, so there is that aspect of it too, namely the red lines that have proven less sounds, red. Sounds all in all generally uh, dangerously vague. Um, yes. uh, let me um, move on to the question of assuming that there is a red line somewhere, that there is some line that the United States simply can't tolerate, or certainly a red line for Israel, which there, there must be, 
uh, that they won't tolerate and will launch an attack. Um, what is our capacity to know whether that red line is crossed? Um, uh, the history of uh, uh, international and U.S. intelligence on the subject of uh, uh, forewarning um, other countries' uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, advances is not great. The surprise in India, North Korea, and so on and so forth. Ambassador Tetrani, what do you think our uh, capacity to, uh, uh, well, how do you uh, gauge the reliability of U.S. intelligence on the Iranian nuclear program? Well, let, me, let me put that into context. Okay. And the Board of Governors, the IAEA Board of Governors report, May of this year, a new one is coming out in a few weeks. It's a vivid statement to what Iran has been doing and what they've accomplished over the last 10 years of our negotiations. We're talking about an Iran with over 17,000 centrifuges, Fudah and Natanz, now come the, the other site you talk about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about enrichment when the Prime Minister Netanyahu speaks about 250 being 250 kilograms mm -hmm. of uranium mm -hmm. enriched at the 20% purity level. And we're, we're talking now about they're at 180 to 190, and to go from 180 to 190 to 250 isn't really, isn't going to take that much time. I know Gary said a year or two, but certainly on the fissile material side, maybe we're talking about a few weeks, maybe a month or two, max. So you're talking about Iran that has built up, and you, you're right, I agree with you, Gary, they built up a capability that is very impressive. And in the recent, also, IEA Board of Directors report to the governors, to the Board of Governors, they talk about activities the Iranians have been doing to, to, to seek a nuclear weapon, some, some efforts they've been making on that. So I mean, when you, when you look at what Iran has done over the last 10 years, where negotiations have given us literally uh, 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 an Iran with greater capabilities, you've got to wonder. So your question about when they cross a red line, well, certainly the Israeli, the, the Prime Minister Netanyahu, a red line is, is pretty clear. He said 250, 190. Uh, I think the IEA has monitors in, 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 in Iran, and they've been doing some very good work. Iran is not North Korea. Now, mind you, we've been negotiating with North Korea for 20 years. Hopefully, we don't need 20 years with Iran. We have 10. And, and what we have is, a, is an Iran with greater capabilities. So I think the IEA has been doing some excellent work. Now, if, if Iran should invite them out of the country, they could really close that gap very quickly, but it would be a significant indicator of what their, their true intentions are. So I, I also agree with that. The, the, the decision is with the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, so I, I think we would know when they crossed the Israeli red line of 250 kilograms mm -hmm. of, a, of a uranium enriched at the 20 percent purity level. I think we would know that. We would know that because of the IAEA, I, or we would know I, that because of our, I think, our I think a, national strategic a combination assets. of issues. I think Iran is not North Korea. Mm -hmm. Iran is not the black hole that North Korea is in, in so many ways. And I think there, 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 is, there is more information available to all of us as to what Iran is doing with their nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. So I think we would know. And I think, the, uh, I think one of the reasons why the Supreme Leader has not pulled the trigger and made that decision is I think he correctly understands that we would know. Mm -hmm. So he's at the tipping point. So you stay at the tipping point where you have, if you want to pull the trigger, you could, you could rush to that point, and I think the Israelis have spoken about that, that window when they could rush to that point. Or if you make that decision, the consequences that would, that would entail. And knowing that we, in my view, based on my exposure, and I defer mm -hmm. to my colleagues here, we would know. Mm -hmm. in my um, let me go to Joe Sincione. I want to um, in the next round of questions, get to the Iranian mindset because I think that's important and there have been some changes. But just to set up another conversation for uh, later on, I just wanted to get your opinion, Joe Cerenciani, of uh, the reliability of the IAEA presence in Iran. Obviously, it is a, this is not a token presence. It's a real non-proliferation treaty IAEA presence. They go and do inspections. And so there is a real international eye on the ground there. You, do you have a difference of opinion with Ambassador Trani about their ability to uh, detect what's going on? Oh, no. Most of what we know about the Iranian program comes from the IAEA uh, inspections. How many uh, centrifuges they have, how many centrifuges are actually operating at this point, um, how much uranium they produce, mm -hmm. at what level. And they, they have regular inspections. I believe they're every three, three and a half weeks. And so the, the 
The question isn't do those inspections work? They do. We know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The question is can we have more intrusive inspections? Can we have them more frequently? Can we extend them as we have in the past for a brief period in Iran in, in 2004, 2005 mm -hmm. to include undeclared facilities, to include plans about new facilities? That's one of the issues that are being discussed in the P5 plus one talks with Iran. I see. Gary, did you have something? Yeah, just to clarify one thing. I mean, the Iranians basically have two pathways to build nuclear weapons. Yeah. One is what we call breakout. That would be using the facilities that are safeguarded by the IAEA to throw out the inspectors and begin to move toward producing weapons-grade uranium. Now, that's a very risky approach because the inspectors, obviously, if they were not there anymore, we would have strong reason to believe that the Iranians were moving toward producing a nuclear weapon. And at least under current circumstances, we would have sufficient time to destroy those facilities before they could produce um, enough weapons-grade uranium for even a single weapon. The other pathway we call sneak out, which is building secret facilities, and that's clearly the preferred path. I mean, both of Iran's current enrichment plants, Natanz and, and Gom, started life as secret facilities, which were subsequently exposed, and the Iranians were forced to put them under international inspection. So I think looking forward, I think it's almost inevitable that at some point, if the Iranians want nuclear weapons, they will try to build another secret enrichment plant. But and they this, have a very bad track record on keeping these things secret. We that's my point. We knew about them years, um, let me say, we knew about them some time before we publicly exposed them. And that's my point. As long as we retain the intelligence capacity to mm -hmm. detect these clandestine facilities before they become operational, that gives us a very strong um, ability uh, to take preemptive action. Mm -hmm. And, and sorry, on that point, yeah. what mm -hmm. they're doing uh, in Iraq yeah. about the plutonium refinery. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th this is a pathway to oh, yeah. plutonium fissile Let material me for the clear, There's a city uh, called Iraq in Iran, it's not Iraq, um, uh, where they are developing not a uranium uh, capacity, but a plutonium capacity for an implosion bomb of the kind that was used in Nagasaki. Um, and uh, so this is showing, in your mind, yes. continuing intention. intention. Right. Um, well, uh, whatever the case on the intelligence, it certainly seems as if Iran is driving the train here. Uh, we're trying to shift their path, but by and large, it's them ma make calling the shots. So um, it's important to, to spend a little time, I think, on the developments um, politically there. Um, they have started something of a debate in Washington about what the, what the proper uh, response is. Um, but why don't we start, Ray, um, uh, with the election of uh, Hassan Rouhani. He's an experienced nuclear negotiator, uh, a, uh, a very experienced uh, politician. He's not a firebrand in the mold of uh, Ahmadinejad. He's um, somewhat adverse, I think, to the Revolutionary Guard. Um, he's uh, aligned with the clerics. Um, uh, what does his election mean for uh, the likelihood of a confrontation with the United States over the nuclear program? Well, I, I'm of the school of thought that didn't believe that confrontation had a high probability. I mean, so if you, you don't believe there's a high probability, then you believe in low probability, so his election has reduced that probability even further. Uh, I would have to say that you don't often hear somebody speak on behalf of President Ahmadinejad, but President Ahmadinejad did want an arms control agreement with the United States. Uh -huh. And he tried very hard to get one. I mean, for various complex reasons that he was unable to discharge that uh, really since 2010 and so forth. Uh, so in that sense, there's a chief executive that potentially wants a nuclear agreement. Uh, now, President Rouhani has had a different reception in the international community because he has introduced himself differently. Mm -hmm. He has introduced himself with a, with a lexicon of moderation and so forth. Uh, I think he is, unlike 2003 when he was very unfortunate to be given the nuclear portfolio, he is dealing with a program that is much more mature and has much more capabilities. And at, in 2003, his function, his responsibility was to preserve what Iran didn't have. Today, his responsibility is to sustain what it does have. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's a different kind of a 
kind of an obligation, different kind of a diplomatic obligation. That's very obligation. interesting. Let me just dwell on that point a second. So you're saying that the fact of their advances over the years gives them an interest in not having, not pushing a confrontation with the United States because they might lose all of this great equipment. That well, I would got. say the context is different. Mm -hmm. the, the nuclear, the, the physics of this is different. The context is different because they, they have much more of a, advanced nuclear capabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's so much that he wants to avoid confrontation because of losing that capabilities. He's got to find a diplomatic way of preserving that capability and advancing it further. Mm -hmm. uh, so the diplomatic challenge ahead of him is far more substantial than it mm -hmm. was in 2003. Uh, the hurdles are more significant. Uh, if he doesn't have a relationship that's positive with the Revolutionary Guards and others in the security services, then that is to his detriment. Mm -hmm. Because then there's an alternative power center that is very suspicious of the moves that he makes. T tell us a little bit, unpack that a little bit, because they, they uh, at times have acted as if they were the Revolutionary Guard, as if they were their own authority, and that is potentially destabilizing. And so, well, I, um, I, I, I think, the, how does Iran make its security policy? I mean, who knows? Uh, there are some indications of it in Rouhani's own book about how they did it, which was a fairly elaborate process of consultation across various ministries and so forth. I, you know, it's, it's strangely enough, including the use of public opinion polling. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, the things have changed. Uh, security services are much more prominent in this issue. So he would have to have their buy-in. Mm -hmm. uh, President Ahmadinejad said recently that for a long time he has not been involved in the nuclear issue. Mm -hmm. He said other people are handling that. I don't know if that means the Office of Presidency has been excised from nuclear deliberations or President Ahmadinejad has been excised from nuclear. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's been a structural change. Gotcha. Uh, but either way, I think President Rouhani will have his own initiative. He will have his own he will have his yeah. determinations. And that has to be negotiated through the system, it, which is a kind of a complex system now. In some cases, the state institutions are pitted against each other mm -hmm. in an adversarial manner, which increases the risk of paralysis within the Iranian body politic on this issue. And just briefly, what is the relationship, to the extent that we know it, between Rouhani and the uh, Supreme Leader? Quite close. Well, for past 10 years, the Supreme Leader has been denouncing 2003-2004 agreements that Rouhani has made. Uh -huh. uh, Sup Supreme Leader's speeches, I don't think can be read. I think they work better as a visual experience. Uh, because he sits on a stage, not like this one, and people, where they're seated depends on their authority. Mm -hmm. And in one speech in Government Day or whatever, he was renouncing the 2004 Paris Agreement and Tehran Agreement that Rouhani had negotiated. Well, I had nothing to do with it, et cetera, et cetera. And Rouhani was sitting there, <laughs> <laughs> and the camera just showed him. <laughs> because Rouhani has insisted, and justifiably so, that every decision he made, Ali Khamenei approved of. Now, there is an episode in Rouhani's own book. I haven't seen anybody, anybody uh, deny it. Uh, the decision to suspend in 2004, which was the most momentous decision Iran made. And this is to suspend the nuclear weapons. The program. nuclear program. The nuclear program in general. The enrichment, the centrifuges. OK. okay. Yeah. To stop them from being put in, to stop yeah. them from spending, to suspend any production. And this was in the immediate wake of the US invasion of Iraq. Yeah. This was okay. in negotiations with what were called EU3, mm -hmm. Germany, France, and Britain. Uh, according to Rouhani's own book, the Europeans and Iranians were at an impasse, and the Europeans said, we're going to pack our bags and leave. The Europeans were represented by Fisher, Straw, and I don't know who represented that. Who was a French foreign minister? I don't know, Dilip Hendon. And Rouhani calls up the president, Khatami, and says, what do you want me to do? Hmm. And he says, well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of your call. Uh -huh. But we don't want these negotiations to fail. Uh -huh. But it's your call. Uh -huh. Why is the president not making a call? Who knows? Uh -huh. So he calls the Supreme Leader's office. He goes, what should I do? And it goes straight to voicemail. <laughs> Never gets back to him. <laughs> Rouhani makes the decision for which he is vilified for the next 10 years to uh -huh. suspend. Uh -huh. What this tells me that Ali Khamenei is not going to take ownership of any nuclear agreement. Uh -huh. He's just not going to take ownership of it. So Rouhani, if he negotiates a nuclear agreement with the West, it's his agreement. Hmm. And he has to figure out, in light of his experience, what that implies. So I think he will try very hard to get public acknowledgment of everything he does. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So does everybody agree that Rouhani is going to try and get an agreement? Yes. yes. 
I mean, I think he'll try to get an agreement. The question is whether or not the Supreme Leader will allow him to make the kind of concessions that will be necessary to get an agreement. Well, We've talked about the expansion of Iran's nuclear program, but the other side of the ledger is also important. At the same time, the sanctions have expanded to the point where it's been devastating to Iran's economy in terms of loss of income, mm -hmm. inflation, unemployment, and so forth. And the reason why Rouhani was elected in large part is because of public discontent yes. with the policies of the Iranian government that have produced this economic damage. So I, you know, I think Rouhani is in a difficult position. On one hand, he wants to get the sanctions relieved. Clearly, that's what the public wants and what the Supreme Leader wants. But on the other hand, it's not clear that he's in a position to offer the kinds of nuclear concessions that the US and the mm -hmm. other Western powers would demand as a price for lifting the sanctions. I should say that this is not a universally held view. Uh, uh, there, are, there are plenty on the hawkish side of the spectrum who view Rouhani um, as just a, a technically very capable diplomat who's capable of dividing the US from its allies, continuing its program of pace, and uh, then uh, achieving the nuclear capability um, uh, while essentially stalling. So the next- By the way, those two positions are not inconsistent. Yeah, but, but uh -huh. let me just- Yes, please, I, I don't consider myself hawkish. Okay. But I-, I, I I'll, I'll be the well, no, know, but, proxy but, hawk. But, but, but let me just say, I, I mean, they have developed this program to this extent uh -huh. over this period of time, after talking about the halt in 2003, 2004, and what they're doing. And given what we're hearing from the uh, IAEA, and, and seeing where the Supreme Leader has been very critical in making, and I think the sense is he, he's making the ultimate decisions, whether it's, it's overtly making them or implicitly making them, he's calling shots. Mm -hmm. Now, Rouhani is going to come in here now and all of a sudden it's going to, the default goes to Rouhani. I, I don't see, if there are concessions in quotes, many concessions. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is where I would think Iran is on a path. It's not a question of getting off that path. It's a question of continuing the path, but also finding ways to, to, to uh, moderate the sanctions and the, and, the, and the pain they get from the reaction to their pursuit of this nuclear weapons capability. But walking away from that capability, I don't think there's anything out there that says anything. Gotcha. OK, so the, then the next important thing to, to, to think about is how do we test his intentions and how do we see what the possible routes uh, to yes. get what we want from him are. So um, the policy from the start for Obama, um, despite the initial outreach and then the toughness, or perhaps that doesn't belie it, is, has been a two-track approach where um, you offer a potential deal on the one hand and try and ratchet up the pain of not taking a deal on the other. The sanctions um, have been a very good example of that and, and very effective. Um, uh, is Sticking with the offer that's out there that was made um, uh, last spring um, and not sweetening the deal now that Rouhani has been elected uh, the right approach or should we show some good faith now that this new face uh, um, is, is on the scene? Who wants to take a first crack? We have to do more than we've been doing. We have to take advantage of this moment. And let's be clear about this. The great tragedy of the U.S.-Iranian relationship for the last several decades has been that when one side has wanted to talk, the other side has not been willing to talk. Mm -hmm. And we may be entering a moment where both sides are willing to talk, where you have a president of the United States who wants to make a deal, does not want to overthrow the regime, wants to make a deal with the regime. You may now have a regime that is willing to, to talk because of the economic sanctions that have crippled the economy, because of the changing environment in the, in the region this Sunni-Shia conflict that mm -hmm. threatens Iran's interests. They, they just lost their major ally, Assad, who may be, be still Syria. be a warlord mm -hmm. in Syria, mm -hmm. but is no longer the ruler of Syria. So these guys are in a tough situation, and for their own strategic interests, they may now want to have so a what reconciliation. Is, so, so, so what is giving them, what is, what is uh, baiting the hook look like? So it, the thinking has been Mm -hmm. But this is the P5 plus one, so the five mm -hmm. permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany mm -hmm. tabled an offer mm -hmm. uh, s several months ago in the last round of negotiations. That was, they call it a confidence building measure. It's not solving the whole problem, it's solving part of the problem. And the basic idea is to lengthen the fuse. Stretch out the length of time it would take Iran to break out. Mm -hmm. And that means 
S Iran suspending any enrichment over 20%, so you keep making the low level 3.5% fuel, mm -hmm. but don't go to this 20% level. Getting rid of the stockpile, the, the 180 kilograms that Joe uh, talked about, move that out. Agreeing to broader inspections so you can more quickly Should see what they're up to. Should we take one of those off the table, give them a free pass on and one? Or? Wait, and then in exchange, mm -hmm. the, the United States and others would start to lift the sanctions. Not lift them, start mm -hmm. to lift some of them, some of the banking restrictions, mm -hmm. the restrictions on trading precious metals, for example. Things that the President could do without Congress's approval and could do fairly, fairly quickly. Um, some people feel that that, uh, it, it, that deal is too small for Iran to take and you need to sweeten it just a bit. And one of the people who thinks that is one of the people who organized the deal, Bob Einhorn, mm -hmm. who just wrote in Foreign Policy magazine that the time has come to take a few more steps to, to encourage, to make it easier for Rouhani and the Iranian administration to, to make a deal. You also have people like Tom Pickering and Bill Lures writing a terrific article in the New York Review of Books, the current a current issue, uh, elaborating how you could do this, and not just change the deal, but make a gesture. They made show, some very dramatic proposals. They say show, there should be bilateral meetings between, uh, an offer of bilateral meeting between Obama and Rouhani off the bat. Which we've offered to do, which haven't yeah. been accepted by Iran, mm -hmm. but now it might not be a time where you can That's, we, that's putting a lot on the table well, bilateral talks, Or, you know, so at the UN, where mm -hmm. both gentlemen are going to be in mm -hmm. the same building in September, maybe an, arranging a uh, a greeting between the two presidents, a gesture like that to make it easier something for Rouhani. Dramatic. Something dramatic, a breakout to make the deal. Move. What do you think, Gary? I mean, you know, I think a very good early test of whether Rouhani yeah. is able to do something different is whether the Iranians finally accept uh, Obama's longstanding offer to set up a bilateral channel for negotiation. Because the P5 plus one is a very clumsy mechanism. I've sat through those meetings, and it's really kind of a staged event of committee discussions around a table with presentation of prepared positions. To actually hammer out an agreement, you really have to get the two critical parties, the US and Iran, in a room together and do some uh, give and take to see if we can't come up with a deal. And once the U.S. and Iran came up with the deal, I think we could sell it to everybody else. There'd be some quibbling about it, but by and large, it would probably stick. And the frustration for Washington these last four years is that Iran has not been prepared to deal. If we find out, and there are many different ways one could orchestrate this, whether it's a, you know, a meeting between the president and Rouhani in New York, or a meeting between Secretary Kerry and the new foreign minister, we might be able to start a process for bilateral discussions with the Iranians. And in that discussion, if we get it going, I think it'd be much easier to table more comprehensive ideas than the very modest proposals that the P5 plus one have put forward. But I think the Iranians will be in for some sticker shock because if they want the major sanctions lifted, and those are the financial and the oil sanctions, they're going to have to pay a very high price in terms of limiting their nuclear program. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine Washington and the other Western powers being willing to lift those very substantial sanctions unless our concerns about Iran developing a nuclear weapons capability are satisfied. And I have a feeling that when the Iranians hear what that price is, they're going to find it very difficult to agree. That's my yes, may. please. And I, I, I do agree with Gary and Joe. I mean, if we can quickly discern whether Rouhani is in the position to do something and move mm -hmm. in that direction, but hopefully quickly is key, because what Iran has been doing has been, and has been staging this and, 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 and basically pursuing things as they go to negotiate and walk away. Yeah, well, we should say that they're talking about installing new well, higher capacity centrifuges. I mean, you're looking at, look at the centrifuges they've installed. Yeah. We're talking about very, and, and the, the speed with which they can enrich more uranium and, and what have you. So they've been moving very quickly while they go to the P5 plus one, but nonetheless, nothing ever happens. So this has been going on and on. Mm. So hopefully we could sort of, sort of uh, put some bookends on this and say, okay, we'll give a, a, a period of time, but obviously these are policy decisions. But this is an Iran that, is, that has built a significant nuclear weapons capability. We're talking about a tipping point. And secondly, given the investment in the region, and you, and you mentioned, Joe, the, uh, what's happening in Syria and what, what's going on there, and with Hezbollah and with the uh, Sunni-dominated states that are sort of vulnerable, uh, I mean, these are big decisions. Now, is Rouhani mm -hmm. just going to come in and, and do something to move that equation? 
I, I don't want to be a skeptic, but I would say th the facts tell us it's not going to happen that way, but hopefully we try, but we, we let the Iranians know this is not going to go on ad infinitum. Let me offer a quick counterpoint. Mm -hmm. Is Rouhani doing anything to move the equation? Everybody knows President Obama tweets. Well, so does Hassan Rouhani. I follow him. And he sent out a tweet this morning. And he is, was reporting on how he wants the, the Iranian parliament to consider a new letter that was just released on Friday by 131 members of the US House of Representatives to President Obama asking the president to take advantage of this diplomatic moment and further explore the possibility of making a deal with Iran. Basically, let's see if we can give diplomacy a chance. Now, this is almost one third of the House of Representatives sent this letter on Friday. There's never been a letter on, with that many signatures on this side of the, the, the equation on the, on the Iran issue. And Rouhani is citing it, is looking at it. Now, why is he doing that? Why is he drawing attention to that? He's trying, I believe, he's trying to open up and create political space inside his tumultuous government to show that there's a change or maybe a change in the US position that in turn would justify a change in the Iranian position. Uh, I, I, see, I, hope, I hope a deal doesn't turn on the House of Representatives. That's all I can say. Because <laughs> then we're really in trouble. But I, but I see your point. It's interesting that he's trying to leverage that. And the yeah. US House of Representatives has shelved consideration of another sanctions bill. Congress has been a one note uh, banned on this issue. The only thing they've done in Iran is pass more sanctions. Well, they've delayed passing the sanctions bill until it was not going to happen before the August recess. It won't happen until October. Probably so it happen. opens up that window. So that's the time we have to see what we can get done between now and, and sometime in October. Can diplomacy gain some okay. traction? I, I, I'll just say, I, I, yes, I yeah. uh, have to test Rouhani, uh, the uh, proposals made. Uh, presidential meeting. I can see how that helps Rouhani. I can't see how that helps President Obama. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, President Rouhani has said in his press conference that he's for transparency. Mm -hmm. That's between him and Chairman Amano. Yeah. August 3rd, he can call Chairman Amano and say he's willing to complete the work plan that Iran negotiated with IAEA in 2006. This is the chairman of the IAEA. Uh, the right. Director General. Director General, that, thank you. That particular work plan has thus far remained incomplete. Mm -hmm. IEA does not have access to the resources, to the evidence, and to sites that it wants. If President Rouhani can complete that work plan, which is not that difficult to do, that's a test of his sincerity but and why, his authority. Why his would he do plan. that outside of a deal? Because he suggests that Iran's program is lawful, legal, and embedded mm -hmm. on NPT and international non-proliferation regime. And the person who certifies that is Chairman Amano. We, we have a lot That's of a very simple tests. A lot of policymakers who, who are making the calls on these issues in the room. And so I want to make sure and leave enough time for, for questions. Let me just ask uh, one last question, which is uh, this has really been a three country story from the start. It's been the United States, it's been Iran, and it's been Israel. And the US has responded repeatedly to um, valid um, existential concerns um, that Israel has. Um, uh, what is the possibility of um, Israel somehow scotching a deal or responding to a failed deal in a way that gets the United States drawn into a war? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm convinced that last year um, Prime Minister Netanyahu wanted to attack Iran and was looking for some kind of green light or at least a yellow light from Washington, and he didn't get it. There was very strong opposition from the White House from U.S. allies and from within uh, the Prime Minister's own government against a um, strike by Israel at that time. And I think that uh, the Prime Minister will continue to get strong mm -hmm. resistance unless the Iranians do something that would you know, precipitate an attack. And this goes back to the point I made originally. Seems to me we have a strong interest in privately warning the Iranians that certain actions they could take in terms of advancing toward building nuclear weapons could trigger a conflict. And if they did something like go to higher levels of enrichment or kick out the IAEA inspectors, I think it would be impossible to hold back the mm. Israelis. In fact, it would probably be impossible to hold back the well, United well, States. Which would be understandable. I mean, here they have gone to a, a, over a, close to 190 kilograms mm -hmm. of uranium mm -hmm. enriched to the 20% purity level. And we're talking about 250 for, and we're talking about 6,000. 6, enriched to the 5% mm -hmm. level. We're talking about five nuclear weapons. So Iran sees the tipping point, I mean, uh, uh, Israel sees the tipping point with Iran as something 
that is very existential. It's something that could happen quickly. Oh. So yes. But although, although just to be just so to be clear, the the intelligence is 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 not at all definitive that that Iran is pursuing weaponization, right? Well, they're well, refining they uranium, but but, but, but we should be clear that, that they haven't. Nobody's said that, that they're. That's a fair point. But, okay. but if you look at the last again, the, mm -hmm. the Board of Governors report from mm -hmm. Omano, and mm -hmm. when they speak to that issue, mm -hmm. to the concerns, and that, that speaks to the inspections and the, and the other aspects okay. of having access. But here's the problem for Israel: an Israeli military strike on the, some of the nuclear facilities in Iran would be ineffective counterproductive, and would likely start another regional war. Well, could draw is, the U.S. in, which could affect their which goals. Would, right. which, could draw, which would be a larger right. regional war, which okay. is why the, the, many of the former security and intelligence chiefs in Israel think an Israeli, Israeli attack is stupid. Active debate. And, and have Very argued against debate, it. Okay. Looking around the room, uh, John McLaughlin, please. Well, <clears throat> Joe's last comment sort of heralds my question a bit. Iran discussions always remind me of that old saying that problems have solutions, but dilemmas have horns. And Iran seems to be in the latter category, and it don't seem to be great answers no matter what you do. So every outcome has its problems. So uh, all the talk of red lines, it seems to me, is driving us toward greater acceptance of a military option. At least that's what I hear over and over again. So I wonder if you could play out the consequences of a military strike. One school of thought I've heard is that Iran retaliates, it doesn't just take it, and we get into that wider war, and the wider war ultimately becomes about regime change in Iran. That's one scenario I've heard, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Second, three or four years ago, people talked seriously about the possibility that we could live with an Iranian nuclear weapon. And this was in a period when most people said, look, they're going to get it. And a lot of what you've said today could lead to that same conclusion. Look, they're going to get it. So if they get it, what do we do then? Uh, and how would diplomacy work? I could spin out some options about how diplomacy could work in our favor then. But what if they do get it? What do we do then? How do we, how do we live with it? And was that directed at Ambassador Detrani or the panel general? Okay. Well, so, and keeping in mind that, that, that then Secretary of Defense uh, Robert Gates argued to the president in a small group in the Oval Office that the final uh, position should all else fail uh, uh, should be containment. Well, you, you say if they should get it, John, that's exactly right. Because I think it's clear to everyone, a nuclear arms race in the region, certainly Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, they're just not going to sit there and see that. And we're talking about an Iran that supports terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. And we're talking about the security of those nuclear weapons, the fissile material. The president had two nuclear security uh, summits to, to, to bring this issue together. Here we're talking about a breakout and other countries would follow suit. So I think it would be devastating to the region, and it goes beyond the region. Okay, so wait, that's, that's the consequences of, of a policy of containment, the consequences of if Iran gets a weapon and we don't yep. uh, uh, take it out. Um, the initial question was, and that's one bad outcome, one horn of the dilemma, Joe Cernsion, you want to address uh, the, the outcome of uh, military intervention? Yeah, so let's take an Israeli strike. Uh, probably conducted by their F-15s, F-16s, overflying Jordanian and Iraqi space. Um, they have 1,000 to 2,000 pound bombs plus electronic warfare capabilities. They could probably conduct the strikes with very few losses. They could certainly take out some of the facilities. My first target would be Isfahan, the, uh, the uranium enrichment facility that Gary and I visited in 2005. Soft target, probably take it out pretty easily have a harder time with the underground facilities at Natanz. Not clear that those bombs can penetrate, probably can't touch at all the, the deeper underground facility at Fordo, but you could cause some damage to the entrance facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But here, so you could degrade their nuclear capability, and most people think you could set the program back a year, maybe even two, from an Israeli attack. The costs, on the other hand, are substantial. You do not stop the program. You delay it, but you don't stop it. You probably accelerate it. All debate inside Iran about whether to go for a bomb would be over. 
You know, Iran has not yet decided whether to build a bomb. That's been the national intelligence assessment for years, and it still is. That decision would probably then be made. And then obviously, attack. lots and of other consequences, like the uh, Federation of American Scientists has said $1.7 trillion to the global economy. Let me be quicker. You know. Almost certainly, Iran retaliates. And that means there's going to be a regional war. Does the US get drawn in? It, 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 it might. Economic consequences, oil traffic stops in the Strait of Hormuz. You could, the, the conflict alone could, could trigger a global it's bad recession. All and so that just multiplies after that, which is why Anthony Zinni's famous quote is, if you like the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, wait till you see the war with Iran. It okay. would make those two wars look like a warm-up act. Quick, this could quick. get very ugly very quickly, Gary which was, is why you yeah. see the hesitation about jumping to this military okay. solution. Gary it's not at all clear there in, is a military in solution. In the meetings in which the outcomes were discussed and gamed out and laid out, so let's get a couple of quick thoughts on, on both bad outcomes. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of um, U.S. options, I mean, unlike Israel, the U.S. military mm -hmm. is obviously much more capable in terms of destroying or severely damaging all the key targets. It wouldn't stop the program. No military action is going to stop the program unless you invaded and occupied the country, which is not an option on the table. But in terms of setting the program back, a U.S. strike would be more effective. Uh, on the other hand, as Joe points out, there are a number of uh, uh, potentially unanticipated or difficult to predict consequences. Would the, you know, how would the Iranians retaliate? One school of thought is that they would be very cautious about a direct attack against U.S. forces uh, in the region or U.S. allies in the region because they recognize that would lead to a much larger war with the United States and they would lose. Uh, instead, they would simply you know, confine themselves to terrorist attacks or other indirect activities. But there's another school of thought that the Iranians, if they felt that this attack was a precursor to an effort to overthrow the regime, they might very well throw caution to the wind and take the kind of actions that would, in fact, lead us into a major conflict. And that would have conflicts, for, and that would have consequences. For actions oil like prices. attacking us in like the Like attacking places, our forces proxy in the Persian terrorists. Gulf, okay, exactly. Right. Okay. So, I, I mean, I would say, just to summarize, the uncertainty about what the consequences of an American attack would be is probably the major deterrent, probably the main reason why it's an unattractive option. If we were confident mm -hmm. that we could destroy those nuclear facilities and, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't lead to a broader conflict, it'd be much easier to say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, looking around, uh, looking around. Okay, in the back, in the center. I uh, Shibli Talhamish from the University of Maryland and Brookings. Um, I, my question is uh, also on the Israeli threat. Uh, is it a credible threat? I, I want to look at it from two angles. One is from the way, from the point of view of Iran. The Iranians have been acting as if they don't take the Israeli threat seriously at all. They take the American threat seriously. The most recent comment was from Rouhani himself, who said, it makes me laugh. He said when people asked him about the threat. So the Iranians are acting as if they don't take the threat of an Israeli uh, attack seriously. I wonder whether you think that's just a posture or whether they, uh, there, there's some people who actually think that the Iranians take the Israeli threat seriously. But the second thing on the Israeli threat, that discussion we've had now about the consequences, um, I wonder personally, and, and Gary, I know you, you've said they were close to it at some point in the past year. I know the administration felt that. I wonder whether that was also credible, not what makes you think it was credible, for two reasons. One is that Israeli public opinion has been decidedly over, I, I do public opinion polls on this issue in Israel, and the majority of Israeli public opinion opposes an attack on Iran without American support, and second, when you look at the military establishment, given what you've all said, the uncertainty and the delay, Israel and Iran are, have never been at war. They are not now. It is principally a rhetorical war. So if you, in, you engage Iran at war, and then you're at war with Iran, besides being at war with the Arabs, and some year down the road, even if you delay them more than one year, or two years, or three years, or five years, they're going to end up with, you're going to end up being at war with nuclear Iran. Why would Israel want to do that? So I'm, I'm wondering whether you can think of a scenario where the, this is a credible threat from the Israeli point uh -huh. of view. Start, Ray, with uh, um, Iranian perceptions of the Israeli threat. I think the rhetoric. Thank you, Shibli. Great question. The rhetoric, as Shibli suggested, is dismissive. And <laughs> I'm not sure if the rhetoric actually suggests what their real intentions are, what their real perceptions are. Uh, 
I can't decipher that because I'm not part of the Council of the Iranian Policymaking. I usually get Iranian decisions right two, three weeks after they make them. Uh, <laughs> but not I, a bad I, ratio. I, I, I would say that the bulk of the evidence, the cumulative evidence, suggests that they do take the Israeli threat at practical level seriously, but at rhetorical level are kind of derisive of it. Okay. Uh, and I think it behooves them to take it seriously. I think one of the things that's not maybe missing in this conversation is that the introduction of Iranian nuclear weapons in the Gulf, in the Middle East, uh, does actually in some ways constitute an existential threat to Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a serious claim. Mm -hmm. On any given week, three things can happen if Iran has nuclear weapons. Iranians can, Iranian presidents and supreme leader can talk about extinction of Israel, one of their favorite topics of discussion. Uh, they can ship arms to Hezbollah. They often do that, and that may be interdicted. And they may have military exercises that tries to introduce conventional and nuclear weapons at the same time. If you're an Israeli defense planner, and you're looking at these three things that happen in one week, you can say to yourself the following. They've been talking about extinction of our country for three decades. Shipment of arms to Hezbollah is an old trick that they've been doing. Mm -hmm. And it is not unusual for a country that have nuclear weapons to try to integrate the totality of its defense forces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you can say they're getting ready to attack us with their right, nuclear weapons. Right. The point I'm trying to make, Israeli defense establishment has to make that call three, four, five, six, eight, ten times a year. I think that answers the Israel bluff part of the question. That's so a very serious threat another, to Israel. Okay, over, over here. Yep. In the, no, uh, behind you, sorry. There you go. Uh, hi, I'm Harrison Monsky from Foreign Affairs Magazine. A bit of a more historical question. Um, in 1963-64, the Johnson administration actually considered a preemptive strike against China, and they actually explored this with the Soviet Union at the time. Mao was uh, viewed as a highly ideological, um, irrational uh, dictator who had killed millions of his own people, and yet the administration decided uh, not to respond with a strike to the 1964 test. So what do you think, if anything, the Chinese case does tell us, given that there were predictions that there would be a cascade of proliferation afterwards um, and that the arsenal would grow to be huge? I mean, I, can, can I just comment sure. on that? I mean, China was going through the Great Leap and they were in the, the Cultural Revolution. China just didn't have their act together. I don't think anyone saw that as an existential threat, per se. Mao just didn't have his hand on it. And, and so I, I, I think it's a totally different equation when you look at the Middle East and certainly Israel facing an Iran with nuclear weapons. Great. Ambassador, uh, uh, Admiral Blair in the back, please. A question for Ray Take. When I was wrestling with this problem um, in, in government, I always tried to look a little bit wider than this narrow trade-off between easing sanctions on the one hand and having a nuclear capability on the other hand. It seems to me that most national, big national security decisions take into account a much wider range of, of factors, not only external, but also very much uh, internal and wider internal than simply whether the price of you know, gas and the exchange rate is, is, uh, is, uh, is ruinous. And I wonder if you can, uh, you know, despite your uh, your modesty about your predictive capability, if you could at least talk to us a little bit about the importance and the shape of some of these other factors that surely will come to play in the Iranian mind uh, as they decide uh, where to go for, whether to go forward or not. This is more explanatory as opposed to predictive, so I can have a better shot at it. That's uh, uh, a pretty good facsimile <laughs> is explanatory. It, it, uh, it, it we're we're down at the two minute warning, so this will be the last. Sure, uh, I, I, we, I, we can I'm have a to... last round if we have time. Uh, I would say there are a number of contending schools of thought about how the nuclear program should be perceived. Uh, I, I do believe that President Rouhani comes from the wing of theocracy that tends to see the nuclear program in a wider context of Iran's relationships, not just its commercial contracts, but how it affects its regional position. And perhaps that regional position will be detrimentally affected. So they do tend to situate the nuclear program in a broader context of Iran's relationships. There is a school of thought. Uh, represented to some extent by Ali Larajani and perhaps by members of the Guard Corps that tend to have, and certainly that was a position of Saeed Jalili. They see the nuclear program as an end of itself that should be divorced from all of the concerns and considerations and inhibitions. And there's this, um, uh, uh, strange enough, Ali Larajani gave a speech to that effect to the gathering of the Revolutionary Guards 
in essence suggesting that Iran will be in a stronger international position in the, on the other side of the mushroom cloud. That it's the best way of reclaiming its contracts, enhancing its regional position, and presenting a deterrent against the United States, whom they tend to believe is actor of the change of regime. So there is a school of thought that suggests that Iran, in, with possession of nuclear weapons, would be in a stronger position domestically. Uh, the regime will be in a stronger position because you look at the North Korea case that was talked about before. When the new North Korean leader came about, everybody had an investment in his success. Nobody knew anything about him mm -hmm. because they didn't want an alternative, namely a collapsed Quick, regime. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. so domestically, internationally, and regionally, Iran's position would be better off. There is a school of thought that suggests that. We're and this is the context and impasse within Iranian body politic. I'm, I'm afraid we are officially out of time. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you again for the Thanks, guys. Thanks, you. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks.